Hello, uh, welcome to this special webinar on to accept or not to accept what makes a good scientific editor. My name is Simon Clark and I'm the European Geoscience Union's Project Coordination Officer. Uh, today we have three speakers, all senior editors from one of our longest running open access journals, Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics. We have uh, James Allen, a reader at the University of Manchester and UK National Centre for Atmospheric Science. Wolf Muller, Deputy Director of the Institute of Energy and Climate Research, and Martina Kramer, aerosol physicist also at the Institute for Energy and Climate Research. There'll be time for questions towards the end. If you have a question, please enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, and yeah, I don't think there's any further housekeeping, so perhaps James, you'd like to start. Okay, so um, uh, thank you for listening in. Um, uh, my, as said before, my name is James Allen, um, based in the UK at the University of Manchester, also the National Centre for Atmospheric Science. And the uh, talk I'll be giving on is how to become an editor. Right, so I thought I'd start off uh, just by giving a quick overview of myself, my career and how I ended up as a, um, you know, where, where I got to uh, being a senior editor at ACP. Um, uh, did my undergraduate and my PhD at what was then UMIST, which kind of was ultimately incorporated into the University of Manchester. Um, my background is in the uh, atmospheric science group um, within what was old, the, the old UMIST physics department. And I've uh, since been based out of Manchester, also working for the National Centre of Atmospheric Science. Now, my chosen area of research is in aerosols, specifically the uh, in situ measurement of aerosols. Um, the, those familiar with my work might know the, the work I did for my PhD and uh, postdoc years, uh, working with aeros principally with aerosol mass spectrometry. But I've also done a lot of work within black carbon measurement and uh, also within ge more general kind of air quality research um, and also more recently looking at emissions. So how did I become an editor? I just thought I'd post this picture because it's pretty much uh, this guy's fault. Um, my own particular route was via Dave Toppin, who for a long time I shared an office with at Manchester. Um, but he became an editor before me, and um, so my route to becoming an ACP editor was uh, basically through conversations with him, and he referred me on to the uh, ACP executive. But from my perspective, a load of this, all, all this kind of happened behind the scenes, where um, I was subsequently got an email asking me if, I, if um, I'd be interested in being an editor. Well, what it was, was basically format, uh, sending on my research interests, CV, et cetera. Um, one of the things I'd like to think kind of counted towards my case was the fact that I already had quite a record in reviewing. So not just in ACP, um, I'd also managed to uh, get a positive reputation reviewing for other journals as well. So I had, um, over the years, I've got uh, editor's citations for reviewing for uh, JGR as well. Um, and then years later, uh, when the roles of senior editors were created, I was um, approached um, and asked if I was interested in filling a the C, uh, one of the role one of the positions for the AC, uh, ACP senior editor for the aerosol team specifically. And that's been me alongside Lit Yafang Chen at Max Planck. But I mean, there's one thing, it's not necessarily just a progression from uh, reviewing to editing. I thought um, there's a few things which are fundamentally different between reviewing papers and editing papers. I mean, end of the day, you're all just kind of reading papers, deciding if there's anything wrong with them, deciding whether to publish them, so on and so forth. But it's worth remembering that it's a very different kettle of fish between reviewers where the idea is, is you can... You, you, you can ask some very kind of probing, provocative questions uh, about a particular work. Um, but at the end of the day, all a reviewer does, and I sometimes have to re remind the reviewers of this, is that they only, rec they only give recommendations to the editor. So it's the editor that has the ultimate responsibility of what to do with the paper. And that's based on whatever information they have to hand, um, which includes the peer reviews. 
Um, you've got to make the decision based, the decisions have got to be fair, but they've got to be based on scientific quality, novelty, importance, and um, very importantly, they've got to fit the scope of the journal uh, that you're editing. Um, but the key thing here is this is ultimately based on the principle of academic judgment, okay? So this is one of the main um, principles that underpins academia in general, is you're not just applying kind of flowcharts, tick boxes, um, and doing a kind of, um, uh, you're not just applying hard and fast rules. Uh, that is fundamentally an element of academic judgment that ends, enters into this. So what kind of skills do you need to be an editor? Um, first of all, you need to be able to assess the context and importance of various works that you presented. And you may have to stray outside your comfort zones because uh, the idea is you want to, I, you, when you're doing peer review, ideally you want to get perfect matches for the subject matter and the reviewers. But when you're editing, sometimes you do have to stray outside your comfort zone. So uh, you don't necessarily have to become an expert in the topic, but you do have to uh, try to gain an appreciation of it. Um, you have to have a good appreciation for uh, what, it, uh, what it is to uh, publish in academia. So when we're talking about what types of evidence and reasoning you need in order to be able to create a journal article that other people uh, would consider worth reading. Um, you need to be able to find um, potential reviewers for papers, obviously. So you need to, and that again, that's sometimes straying out of your comfort zone. You need to be able to be, in, in case it does occasionally happen, when there's disagreement between the authors and the reviewers about who's right and who's wrong, you need to be able to adjudicate these arguments in a, uh, a fair manner. Um, you need to be able to be diplomatic, especially if you're making an unpopular decision. Um, so inevitably, some papers are going to get rejected. We need to be able to be able to handle this situation. It's part of your job as an editor to make these difficult decisions, and you have to be able to justify them, but also not um, getting people's backs up in the process. And you need to, um, very occasionally, it's happened to me a few times, where you send a paper out to review, and the reviewer regrets um, regrets the decision of agreeing to review it because they don't like the paper for whatever reason. Um, that's a situation that happens more often than I'd like, but we, need, uh, we, we are relying on the goodwill of the reviewers. So again, we need to be courteous and appreciative in these situations. And then of course, we also, um, very rarely you get these awkward situations where some people start behaving in a manner that you don't want, that isn't warranted and you do need to calm these situations down. So when's the right time to think about editing? First of all, um, no journal is gonna want uh, an editor who doesn't really know what they're getting into. You need to have a good appreciation of the publishing process, the whole application of peer review in publishing scientific works and being able to deal with other people. So you need a certain skill set there. And a lot of that comes with experience in publishing. Um, you also need some spare time. There's no point taking the job on if you can't afford the time for this. The EGU um, operates the kind of editing and review on a voluntary basis. So you are going to have to uh, offer up some of your time for this. And you also need the motivation as well, because again, this is meant to be uh, a, a kind of an, in, you know, an academic endeavor that we're all doing voluntarily. Um, so you, you don't want to do it just if you, if you, if you, if you don't feel genuinely motivated to, do, motivated to do the job, then I wouldn't recommend taking it. So with that in mind, I mean, if I was someone to ask me when's a good time for someone to think about being an editor, I put kind of early to mid career as being probably a good time because um, I wouldn't necessarily advocate getting someone straight out of the PhD to do it. It's a good idea to have built some experience with publishing, be it as a lead author, co-author, etc., or as a reviewer. So have a good appreciation of the publishing process. Um, well, that said, I wouldn't want to rule out if, if, if you're kind of later on in your career, but you feel you have the uh, time and the skills to spare, then absolutely um, the journal does appreciate the uh, experience of veteran academics as well. So how do you, this is a question I get asked a lot of this, how do you get to be an ACP editor? What do you have to do? You know, how do you apply for the job? Um, 
what happens behind the scenes is there is actually a list of potential editors who have either been approached or uh, have approached the um, editorial board. And so that when we, when uh, ACP decides to recruit more editors, either because we're getting, you know, some people have stood down or because we're getting increasing numbers of submissions within a given field or something, um, the, we've got a list of people that can maybe call on and see if they're interested in joining the editorial board. Um, if you want to make sure that you're on the radar of the editorial board, um, it's a good idea. You can just um, uh, approach one of the editors. Um, it'd be a good idea to include some kind of information about yourself because they may not know you that well. And so like a statement of what it is you do, why you're interested, and uh, also a kind of CV as well. But it's also possible that if uh, sometimes ed editors get headhunted as well. So sometimes these things do come out of the blue. Um, but the kind of things that count in your favor, if you're wanting to become an editor, uh, having a good track record um, in, as regards publishing, so like review process and so on, um, particularly with the Copernicus journals, because we've got our own kind of peer review model and everything. If you've got a good kind of record there and you show a good appreciation of the publishing process, that counts towards it. Uh, having a good reputation in your specialist research area, that obviously counts for a lot. You're going to have to uh, exercise your pro um, professional judgment and um, also like having good knowledge of the subject area obviously helps. Um, so having a good, um, a good reputation within the research field is uh, obviously counts a lot. And then also another thing that will inevitably count towards um, someone being appointed is if you're working in an area where more editors are needed. Um, the example I was giving here would be the area of machine learning within um, uh, uh, atmospheric science. So it's obviously it's, it's a it's it's a fast moving field. It's you know there's a lot of very exciting research and technical developments coming out of this. But we were placed in the situation where we were starting to get more submissions than we had editors that could reliably handle these papers on the board. So there was an effort to try and uh, recruit members there. So what's the workload? Um, the nominal workload, what we ask of people is if you handle, uh, is handling six papers a year. Um, the majority of editors don't have a problem managing this, although sometimes, you know, obviously everyone's got varying amounts of spare time, but that's the kind of expectation. Um, the papers initially, you, you, I, I liken the system to a sushi belt, where we've got these submitted papers and editors are free to pick which ones come up according to which ones they think they're best suited towards. Um, but obviously, if you're not if you don't pick up, if you don't actively pick up enough papers, then you may get a tap off the shoulder, a tap on your shoulder if we're trying to find papers for the need editors. Most of the papers, I'm pleased to say, are quite straightforward. Um, you know, the, the submit a lot of the submissions we get, you know, the authors have put a lot of work into it. There's fundamentally often good research there. Um, so what the job as the editor is to do, first of all, decide if the paper's uh, uh, it's in scope and it's of a sufficient basic quality. Um, in majority of papers, I'd like to think are. Occasionally you get someone who perhaps didn't submit it to the most appropriate, you know, ACP might not be the most appropriate journal, you know, it might want to go to GMD or something like that, or very, or, you know, very rarely we get these papers that are obviously substandard but thankfully they're not very common. So then the next step is soliciting peer reviews. And then after it's gone through the peer review process, then you have to decide if the authors have addressed the reviewers' comments okay, um, whether you need to get additional reviews or anything like that. Worst case, whether you need to uh, reject the paper or something. And then once a paper is accepted, is deciding whether it wants a highlight within um, you know, whether we want to put this paper on a pedestal. Well, most of the, this process is generally quite straightforward and in many cases quite enjoyable. Um, I'm not going to sugarcoat, though. You do occasionally get the problem papers that editors are expected to be able to deal with. Um, unfortunately, these take a disproportionate amount of work. 
to deal with uh, and regrettably do take up more, more of your time and cause more stress. So examples where ones that are problematic is when the paper's kind of at the very margins of the scope of the journal and some difficult decisions have to be made about whether to accept the uh, paper for peer review in the first place. Uh, if you ever get extensive self-plagiarism, um, this problem extends, I'm, I'm sure most academics are familiar with this because it extends way outside of academic publishing, but some authors just don't see the problem with copying previous text. Sometimes it's justifiable, particularly if they're giving technical information, but I've had, I've had authors do ridiculous things like copy previous um, stuff that they'd already had published from previous articles in the same journal before. Situations like that get awkward. Um, the reviewers, not all reviewers um, give the equally good reviews. Um, very occasionally you get the proverbial reviewer too through who gives a very unhelpful review um, or if they just can't be bothered reading it properly. Um, it doesn't help the, well, if they just say, yeah, this paper looks fine, I'm sure the author's happy with that, but that's not what peer review is about. Um, any unprofessional conduct, it gets awkward. Um, thankfully, it's rare, but it gets awkward when it happens. Um, authors making insufficient revisions. That's if the reviewers, you know, they request some changes and the temptation by the authors to give it lip service. But we have to take a firm line on the authors if we do this. And sometimes it can get quite protracted. Introducing new content, this one again, super awkward, is if you introduce something substantial during the peer review process, it can be a way of sneaking in stuff without having it go through peer review properly, but this sort of situation it needs dealing with. Disputes on technical details, especially if it's at the edge of your expertise, this is where you might have to start getting in more reviewers and things to advise on these things. But thankfully, these issues, don't be put off by it. These are not that common um, and you know we are as editors it's part of our job to deal with it but thankfully it doesn't represent the majority of papers it's even quite a small minority and we do like to support new editors as well um, they when we last had our big intake we had a series of web in, um, online seminars uh, this was put on by the executive editors but also around to try and introduce them to the review process, the technicalities of how we receive papers, put them, you put them through the system, who to go to for help and stuff. But also all the new editors are assigned uh, mentors from amongst the senior editors. So someone you can talk to if you're facing difficulties, you know, if you're unsure about something, how to deal with the proverbial awkward authors or reviewers and so on, we can offer advice that way. So with that, um, thanks for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Can we just move on to the next uh, presentation, uh, which Wolf, I think, is you? Yeah, I, I would want to say a few words on this issue, what makes a good editor. You will realize that there is an overlap, um, a lot of overlap, I think, between what, what I will say and probably what Martina will say and, and what James has said, because a good editor and an editor, the motivation and the points that need to be addressed are often quite similar. Anyway, I will uh, go through the questions um, for about 10 minutes and then I think um, Martina can take over. Um, day-to-day -day work looks like. Obviously, um, uh, editing is not everything, but if you think about editing, is the first thing is selecting the papers. And of course, um, as James has said, uh, an important thing is selecting the right paper. So it's which papers can you actually help with the most? You need to have some expertise, but of course uh, you need do not need to be the um complete expert um in a particular field and uh, of course in in the acp set up also some um ambition is to help with uh, not letting uh, letting submitted articles to get so-called orphan 
um, articles or stay orphan for too long, which means that they don't find an editor. Um, so it's also something that if you think you can deal with a particular topic, even if it's not your central topic, you should try and pick up um, uh, articles that have fallen or are in danger of falling through the cracks. One, if you talk about day-to-day -day work, one thing that I think is important in editing, and th this is one of the major things, find the, finding the, the right reviewers. Um, so they need to be uh, really knowledgeable about the field that the paper is talking about, at least um, a large part of the field. Some papers are covering different aspects. But um, of course, they need to find the time. And it's one challenge of finding the reviewers and finding reviewers that actually agree to spend their time on the paper. And of course, reviewing is as everybody learns who's done it even one time, but several times it's, <laughs> it's even more so. It's an important, but also time consuming aspect. And if you want to do it properly, as um, reiterating what James has said, uh, it is a lot of work. You need to really dive into the subject and some superficial, oh, this is like, looks like a nice paper, or the other way around superficially, as I, I looked at it, I don't like it. This is not helpful at all, uh, especially not to the editor, but it's also not helpful to the authors. Yeah, what does an editor actually do? A lot of it is, yeah, looking at the paper, um, communicating with the reviewers. Um, and I think this is important for the editor. Yeah, you get the recommendations. You're not tied to the recommendations, but of course you need to consider them seriously. And um, if you have the right reviewers, they can be really helpful for the editor's job in actually evaluating the paper in the end and in the end making the decision between accept and reject. But there is an interim period. And again, it's something James has already mentioned. The changes to manuscript are important. So reviewers might be generally happy, but then they have particular points that this needs to be changed. And, um, it could be minor details. Yeah, why don't you add another access to this plot? This is somewhat which is easier to, but <clears throat> also major issues. And then if you draw these conclusions, uh, you need to have a different approach or you need to say more details about your model. You don't have, I don't know, the right chemical equation. You don't have the, uh, you make approximations which are not appropriate, et cetera, et cetera. And one way of, of dealing with that, and I think that's also something that an experienced editor would do, if you get revisions, uh, a revised manuscript, look at it, but also don't forget about your reviewers who made these suggestions. And it's often a good idea to go back to the reviewers and tell them this is a revision, this is a reply by the authors, and try and get their feedback and usually they are um, happy about such a procedure um, because they invested all this effort in reviewing the paper and then the question is um, did the authors really react in an appropriate way and a reviewer usually is very interested in in uh, having a look and, and making a, a comment on the quality of the revision which is also an important part I think in the uh, editing process. What's about the workload? Yes, um, it depends, of course, on how many papers you accept. If you accept twice as many papers, you might uh, double your workload. It's not a one-to-one -one relation, but uh, obviously it's, there is some, some relation. So uh, you need to be careful not to accept too many, but of course you expect to help and uh, yeah six is kind of the, the magic number that you should look at, but then it really depends on the paper. It's again, as, as uh, James has said, um, not every paper costs the same amount. And unfortunately, a few papers cost a lot of the, the um, 
a lot of the workload of the editor and uh, it's sometimes difficult to predict in, in the first place. It's like in air quality, which is called cross polluters. So it's about 10, 15% of the fleet that are responsible for more than half of the emissions. And um, this is, I think, something normal in life, but uh, it's something you need to be aware of. And of, this is what I mentioned is, um, it depends on the individual paper. A particular paper yeah. might be straightforward, well-written, getting good reviews, good changes. The authors are willing to do the changes. And then uh, you have a, a smooth process, which is not too time consuming. You still have, it's still time consuming. You have to read the papers, read the reviews, read the replies and so on. But it is kind of a smooth process. If you have divergent opinions between authors and reviewers or different reviewers might have very different opinions about the same paper. And uh, then of course it is um, the editor's job to moderate these discussions and come to a decision. And um, yeah, this is not always easy, but it's one part of the work description, if you like, of an editor to also address these more difficult issues. Then I have a last point, which I stole from Martina because <laughs> I got my, um, sorry about that. The, the last point on my part is what are the main challenges and how do you solve them? And I don't think I need to go into detail here because these are exactly the things that we already talked about. The main challenges are really the difficult decisions, disagreements between reviewers, disagreements between authors and reviewers, adding in new mm -hmm which is sometimes a solution, but um, not always the solution that gives the final answer. And of course, as you know, the editor knows at least some of the reviewers, so they might have different opinions. If a particularly strong voice or a particularly established colleagues makes a comment, nonetheless, this should not be the ultimate decision. It should be the the challenge is to get a balanced view and um, kind of not have this one particular review the, uh, or one particular person just dominating the decision on a paper. But with that, I think I should stop and leave the rest of the questions to Martina and then we can have a more extensive discussion, I think. I start with uh, something I missed. <laughs> uh, so this is say something about me, um, James. I found it quite nice uh, that you presented yourself a little bit. And um, yeah, so my, my, my scientific area is uh, aerosol cloud interactions and clouds. In specifically ice clouds, uh, cirrus clouds, and uh, but also water vapor. And I do over the years uh, measurements and um, and modeling and uh, measurements. I started with ground based measurements. I did chip bone measurements and then switched to aircraft measurements. So <laughs> I did nearly everything <laughs> in my field, which makes it uh, for me exciting. Uh, yeah, and how do I become an editor? Uh, so James nicely presented several ways. And um, so my, my way was to simply ask, I was interested in being an editor. I saw before from my own papers, I saw reviews and uh, editor decisions. And then ACP started with all the open discussions and I, ask uh, Uli Pöschel, I wrote an email saying, I, I want to be part of it. <laughs> and I think this is uh, for the time that I have, maybe that I want to uh, concentrate on because many points I have here on my list are already presented by James and Rolf. But um, yeah. Uh, what makes a good editor from the personal view. So 
Uh, Barrett, she gave us some questions and here on my list is uh, what skills are these diet? So, um, and I think this is something quite important is, uh, yeah, the main thing is you need to like, you need to enjoy writing and you, you need to be interested in writing uh, good papers and uh, not only writing, but also, um, yeah, the publication skills also include to have good graphics. And so this is something that uh, you can learn. So it's not that you are born to publish, uh, but um, yeah, you can have lessons or you can buy books. Uh, when I was young, younger, then there were no, no webinars and such things. Uh, but I, I bought, uh, I bought books and I, I read. How can I do it best? And I think that this is the basic thing if you want to be an editor is to know how a good paper should look look like. And uh, yeah. James already mentioned personal experience with publications. So if you never have written a paper, then maybe it's too early to become an editor. Uh, it's good to have a publication list and maybe a, a paper where you have already some citations. That means the paper was interesting enough to find readers. And uh, also, I think a continuous practice of publication skills. Uh, but I think, yeah, the most important I like to mention is, is uh, I like to mention again, is uh, the, the joy of writing and uh, reading articles and the interest in seeing how the fields you are working in are developing. And, um, yeah, my personal most valuable tips, uh, maybe uh, James and Rolf, you might like to add uh, something to that because this is uh, personal. Uh, my first is for the open discussions. Um, yeah, if, if you are really in the field and then the editor should make the first decision uh, by him or herself. So that means can the paper appear in, a, in the discussions? And there, this I discussed with uh, Uli Pöschel, who started ACP, um, one of the starters of ACP. And uh, I share his opinion. I discussed that with him when I was a fresh editor, is uh, in doubt for the accused. So that means if you are not sure if this is a really, uh, a very good paper, uh, but that it, it, this should be discussed. So let it in the open discussion and then let people decide if, if it's worth to go to ACP or not. So that means not only let the referees decide, but everybody can uh, put in a comment and then the decision uh, will be made. But this should be really open. Uh, that doesn't mean that every paper will make it to the to ACPD into the discussion. So if it's really bad, uh, then it should be sent back uh, for revisions. And then the next thing which I find important, Rolf already mentioned uh, that a little bit, is to have feedback with the referees at each stage of the review process. That means uh, to recognize their work, it's uh, all voluntary. So they, yeah, our work is also voluntary, but all referees and uh, other editors, they spend time and this is worth to recognize. If you don't do that, uh, they will be angry. As you can imagine, you also would uh, probably be angry if you are ignored. Um, and maybe we'll say, I, I don't do that again for ACP. And, um, but the, um, ACP is, or every journal is dependent on the voluntary work. And so be always, uh, uh, yeah, feedback, be friendly and, um, uh, yeah, also friendly, 
if there are discussions between uh, referees and, um, and authors, you need to mediate conflicts. Uh, so this is one of the more difficult parts. Fortunately, that doesn't happen too often that there are really debates. So uh, that the authors are um, not satisfied with, uh, with the reviews, which might happen, or the other way around, uh, referees are not satisfied with uh, the answers of the authors and the changes in the manuscript. So, um, yeah, I think for me, these are the, uh, the tips that I want to give. And uh, with that, I think I come to an end to let some time uh, for questions and discussions. Thank you, uh, Martina. Um, yeah, thanks to all the speakers for their presentations today. Um, I think the first question that popped into my mind actually when I was listening is, we've talked about what makes a good editor, but what makes a bad editor? Is there any pitfalls or things we should be avoiding? Um, I guess I want to really know what what's good to do, but what is there that's bad to do as an editor that we should aim to avoid? So I, I have one idea. Um, if you, I think if you have a difficult paper, so pitfalls are always difficult. <laughs> if you have a difficult paper where it's not sure uh, if this paper will make it to from ACP D into ACP, that means if it's finally accepted for publication, and then um, yeah, if the reviewers reviews are major revisions, and you should not go through two rounds of revision and then reject it. So this, this is something. It's always hard. Nobody likes to reject a paper. Uh, but if you feel that uh, this is hard to repair, then do this decision early, because you cannot give the uh, the authors two or second rounds of revisions and then say, oh, you know, too bad. Uh, I think after at least uh, the second round, then you need to accept it somehow. Yeah. So. This is something in the beginning uh, where I didn't want to reject and then I let them do something and then, oh, what to do now? <laughs> yeah, I could, I could maybe kind of add to that in some of the, again, it doesn't happen very often, but there are occasions where, as you say, you don't want to just keep going for round and rounds of revisions um, you know, because it's not fair on the authors if you think it's not likely to be accepted and it's not fair on the reviewers as well because it really tests their patience as well. Um, but there are occasions though where you think, you genuinely think a paper should be publishable eventually. But if the authors don't bring it up to the standard necessary, then you still can't accept it. And that's where things can get, <laughs> you know, we still have to take a firm line in that situation. But if you've not got grounds to rejection, that can be a, this is where we're talking about the diplomatic skills, because you, I've had to say to some authors in the past, it's just like, look, it's not going to get published until it's ready. <laughs> you know, So, you know, you just got to put the effort into the next revision and make sure that it's, <laughs> it is publishable, you know what I mean? Sure. So basically, don't elongate the review process um, and be mm. diplomatic. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, we have uh, another question, um, and this one is specifically for James. Um, yeah. It's from an ECS perspective. You said to do a lot of reviewing before becoming an editor, but many ECS often aren't considered as reviewers. What is your tip to get this started? Or I suppose you could simply phrase it as how best can an early career scientist build up experience to get into editing? Uh, that's, I suppose this one, that one is kind of a bit of a, yeah, there is a bit of a chicken and egg situation there. Um, particularly if you're active in, an, uh, if you're active in a well-established field, then obviously if you're just starting out, then 
your name might not uh, spring to mind when people are assigning um, assigning papers to review. Um, that's an interesting one because you 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 um, because you can't you don't there isn't really a process by which you can say you know hey look it's me I'm willing to review. Um, if an editor doesn't know you, then it's all, of course, done by reputation and publication record and something. Um, what can happen is, and this happens quite often, is, you know, if, if, if say, an editor does, and this is not just true of ACP, true of all journals, is that often what happens is if someone does get approached who is already kind of drowning in deadlines and already has too many other papers to review, so you know people like established scientists pis and stuff they have the opportunity to refer on to co-workers and i personally as an editor do genuinely appreciate it when if i send it to someone who is established in a field and they've got no time to review it um if they do say if they do know a postdoc or a former phd student who does you know, that I might not know as an editor, then I really do appreciate being put onto these, you know, new people. So that is a way in. Uh, again, though, that is unfortunately within the gift of the established researcher, not the new career one. The other one, which is, I think, a feature uh, that doesn't get used often enough, I don't think, um, but you've got to be careful using it, is we do have the facility for unsolicited comments within um, ACP, you know, you can put a short comment in there. There's not, it doesn't count as part of the, um, it's not a formal review that the authors are obliged to respond to. But if you're struggling to get noticed and you notice a discussion going on within your field that you think you can contribute meaningfully to, then I would kind of maybe consider whether there's something worth saying, um, you know, might get you noticed. And I suppose the other thing as well, if you want to get lots of re review invitations from any journal, it is a lot of the time just getting published yourself, because that if you're looking for someone to review a paper, that's where you get these names from. Is you say, right, who's published in this field before? Particularly if your papers are cited, they get noticed, then that's when the review invitations start coming in. Sure, thanks. So. Um... I suppose a publish one um, and the second option would be to perhaps approach senior researchers and ask them um, to recommend you as a reviewer if they get asked and they want to offload it. Uh, and third, also to engage within the uh, publication infrastructure that exists already. Would that also include, for example, um, Moderation, for example, EGUSphere has uh, moderator applications open, which includes ECS as well. Um, would that be considered when people apply to be an editor? I mean, it, it, it's a bit hard to generalise. I mean, I don't know if anyone, um, I don't know if Martina or Rolf feel different, but I mean, it, 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 it's when appointing editors, it's very much done on a kind of case by case basis, and a lot of it is kind of a more holistic kind of reputation kind of thing but certainly if you want to get noticed then yeah absolutely stuff like eg use fear and things like that uh, i definitely recommend you know just for the sake of getting involved getting noticed getting input into the scientific discourse you know i mean i'd certainly recommend stuff like that well, perhaps i can ask you a question james because we we, we just discussed that during the acp meeting in mainz um one issue was becoming an editor is also uh, uh the the idea is if you if you add in editors from underrepresented communities or countries um could help in bringing in more submission and fostering submissions from regions so for one example that was uh pointed out in in, in, in the last meeting in Mainz was that um we don't have many uh, from 
many editors from the southern hemisphere, not even from Australia, let alone South America. We have a few Brazilians, but that's of course not covering the entire continent. So if people are interested in becoming an editor or know about people that are coming from regions uh, that are underrepresented in ACP, that's, that might also be an issue. And um, perhaps you have a comment on that, but at least I can yeah. make the statement that we have discussed the issue of editors also as a, it's not the only way and it's not a 100% one-to-one relation, of course, but it's also <laughs> might be a way of interacting. Yeah. I, I... You, now you mention that, I'm actually thinking I po possibly should have put a slide in about that because it is a very important issue. And it's something that the executive and the senior, you know, as you know, I've been for some around for some of these conversations as well. I mean, ultimately, ACP is a global journal, but it, it, we still do have a lot of overrepresentation from Europe, North America, and East Asia. Um, so yes, I mean, I completely agree with everything that you just said. I would. I mean, we do have, we have been trying to recruit a few editors, uh, particularly from the Southern Hemisphere, um, you know, and I think, you know, we are, you know, atmospheric science is a global research discipline. And I would definitely encourage if we've got any um, editors that, you know, any kind of would-be editors who are very interested in not just, you um, in, in, I suppose, kind of representing the research scene in these underrepresented areas, then absolutely, yes, we would very much welcome um, uh, editors from these regions. And I think because this thing is, uh, is very important because, I mean, it's not just an ACP thing. Atmospheric science in general often, get, often gets accused of kind of focusing too much on these areas of the Northern Hemisphere where there has traditionally been a lot of this research and so on. But the atmosphere is a very different place in a lot of these countries, you know? It needs researching, you know? And it needs people who appreciate some of the more kind of like local, um, more kind of local aspects of uh, what's going on in these areas. And I think, you know, this is something that I think as a journal, we have a duty to represent. Perhaps I can ask you a question, James, because we, we, we discussed that during the ACP meeting in Mainz. Um, one issue was becoming an editor is also, uh, the, the idea is if you, if you add in editors from underrepresented communities or countries um, could help in bringing in more submission and fostering submissions from regions. So for one example that was uh, pointed out in, in, in the last meeting in Mainz was that um, we don't have many uh, from many editors from the Southern Hemisphere, not even from Australia, let alone South America. We have a few Brazilians, but that's of course not covering the entire continent. So if people are interested in becoming an editor or know about people that are coming from regions uh, that are underrepresented in ACP, that's, that might also be an issue. And um, perhaps you have a comment on that, but that, at least I can yeah. make the statement that we have discussed the issue of editors also as a, it's not the only way and it's not a hundred percent one-to-one relation, of course. You, now you mentioned that, I'm actually thinking I po possibly should have put a slide in about that because it is a very important issue. And it's something that the executive and the senior, you know, as you know, I've been for some round for some of these conversations as well. I mean, ultimately ACP is a global journal, but it, 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 we still do have, a lot of overrepresentation from Europe, North America, and East Asia. Um, so yes, I mean, I completely agree with everything that you just said. I would, I mean, we do have, we have been trying to recruit a few editors, uh, particularly from the Southern Hemisphere, um, you know, and I think, you know, we are, you know, atmospheric science is a global research discipline. And I would definitely encourage if we've got any 
um, editors that, you know, any kind of would-be editors who were very interested in not just um, in, in, I suppose, kind of representing the research scene in these underrepresented areas, then absolutely, yes, we would very much welcome um, uh, editors from these regions. And I think because this thing is, uh, is very important because I mean, it's not just an ACP thing. Atmospheric science in general often get often gets accused of kind of focusing too much on these areas of the Northern Hemisphere where there has traditionally been a lot of this research and so on. But the atmosphere is a very different place in a lot of these countries. You know, it needs researching, you know, and it needs people who appreciate some of the more kind of like local um, more kind of local aspects of uh, what's going on in these areas. And I think, you know, this is something that I think as a journal, we have a duty to represent. I, I completely agree. Thanks. Thanks. Um, more of a general question is, uh, just a whole, whole panel, mm. is how much time do you spend on editing in a normal work week? Perhaps, Rolf, could you comment on that at all? <laughs> It's very, well, uh, you do get these questions on this particular topic and on other topics, how much time do you spend on this or that? And to be honest, I don't really know. It's very difficult to quantify, I have to say. Um, first of all, I'm not sure what a normal week is because <laughs> then you have teaching obligations, you have travel, like, last, uh, the day before yesterday, we were in Mainz for ACP and so on. So it's a bit difficult. Um, I think the, the, and it depends on how many papers you have, you have many papers you have accepted. And again, there will be an up and down. Some people will be, so some papers will be faster. Uh, some people's, uh, some papers, sorry, uh, stay there for longer and then they come back more often. It's very hard to predict what I can say. I think that this is more important perhaps than the actual number of hours. What you should try and do as an editor is of course, um, not to have papers, especially the ones that you are editing, that you're dealing with as an editor, not to have these papers waiting too long for your editor's decision, whether it's, go back to the reviewers, whether it's accept, reject, and all that. Because if you think um, it is something important, you should try and look at the paper and make a decision. On the other hand, if you're an author, you sometimes wonder, why is it taking so long? Um, and of course, the reason might be the editor has just other obligations. He's on a field campaign or um, wherever. Um, on a, on a, in a meeting where he, he or she cannot do this editing duty for a, a few days and then the paper is just waiting there. So what I think is, is more than the actual numbers on average is the obligation that you deal with things that are important to the authors. So sometimes you need to look at the, your to-do list at um, EGU or uh, ACP, and um, which is well organized. So this is also very helpful, I think. Um, you have a to-do list, you know that you have to deal with these papers. The decision is, or the reply is there by the authors. And uh, now you have to act as an editor. And sometimes this is um, coming in between other obligations or time-consuming efforts, and then uh, no, this time you have to devote your time to ACP and to do the editor job. And sometimes this is a, uh, it's a difficult balance. And I think this is more important than, than kind of spending an average time. And it's also sometimes hurts more because now you have to really uh, do this work and not perhaps do something else that you also, would be very interested in and read this particular paper or work on your own paper and things like that. No, you have the duty, you should do something for EGU. So it's fluctuating. It, de it depends a lot of how much workload you take on. 
But I think the, the more challenging, challenging thing is that you have to address certain issues in a certain time frame. Thank you. Um, quickly running out of time, but Martina, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, I only want to add to uh, to Rolf's comments that uh, so to motivate <laughs> potential editors that you can control that the workload. Uh, so um, yeah, you should take six papers per year at least. If you do that, in most cases, the workload is not really high. I would say. Only if you have really difficult papers, which doesn't happen too often. But then, you know, you can, if you have a time where you are very busy, then simply don't pick a paper. And uh, if you have a time uh, which is more relaxed, uh, then pick two papers. So you can control it. And uh, there, uh, yeah, and you should do that. Uh, don't pick papers if you know you are out on a field campaign or something like that. Uh, and you know you don't have time for the papers. And you can, um, in the ACP system, you can sign in times when you are really absent. Um, and then, uh, not able to do any editorial work. So uh, I think this, I like to add that because I think it's important, you can control that. It's, you, you will be not completely overruled by <laughs> a huge amount of work. Sure, thank you. Um, so basically be aware of the time dependencies of the work you have, but also realize you can control the quantity of that work as well. Um, we are just running out of time, so I'm going to close the webinar now. Uh, I just want to thank all our speakers today for giving their time and uh, knowledge to us, and also thank for the attendees who came today. Uh, this webinar will be hosted on our YouTube channel within uh, one week, so keep an eye out for that. Otherwise, thank you for attending. Bye-bye.